Hey everyone, this is an introductory lesson on vitamin D deficiency. So we're going to talk about what vitamin D is. We're also going to talk about some of the sources of vitamin D. We're also going to talk about how it's absorbed and metabolized, why we need vitamin D, what it actually does in our body. And at the end of this lesson, we're going to talk about a variety of causes of vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D deficiency is actually very common around the world. It is a global phenomenon. And vitamin D itself is a fat-soluble vitamin. There are multiple forms of vitamin D we're going to talk about in this lesson. One of them is vitamin D2 also known as ergocalciferol, and there's also vitamin D3, which is cholecalciferol. And because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, it is mainly stored in fat tissue. So vitamin D is required for several processes. We're going to talk about these processes in more detail later, but I'm just going to briefly introduce the processes here. One is calcium homeostasis. So it's important in calcium homeostasis. It's also important in bone maintenance and metabolism, and it's also important in immune system functioning. What are the sources of vitamin D? Where do we actually get vitamin D? So we can get vitamin D from our diets. So animal food products like fish and meat do contain some vitamin D. Fortified dairy milk, so dairy milk that's literally had vitamin D added to it also is a source of vitamin D. And vitamin D supplements, so taking an over-the-counter vitamin D pill is another source as well. But we can also get vitamin D through endogenous synthesis. So endogenous synthesis means that we're synthesizing vitamin D in our own body. And that's actually derived from cholesterol in our skin when it is exposed to sunlight. So vitamin D can be derived from this process when our skin is exposed to sunlight. And it's actually vitamin D3 that is produced, so cholecalciferol. And the recommended daily intake of vitamin D differs depending on the age of the patient. So I won't go over all the numbers for each age group here. If you want more information, please check out the reference in the description below. And as we'll see later, different populations require different amounts than the one stated here. So how is vitamin D absorbed and metabolized? So when you actually do ingest it, or if it's synthesized in your skin, when your skin's exposed to sunlight, what happens? So I'm going to first briefly talk about vitamin D absorption when we actually ingest it from our diet. So if we actually eat vitamin D from our diet, it goes into the gastrointestinal system. And because it's a fat soluble vitamin, we need bile. Bile helps to emulsify fats. And we also need certain pancreatic enzymes like lipase to break down those fats so we can get access to that vitamin D. And eventually as it traverses through the gastrointestinal system, it gets absorbed in the ileum. And the other mechanism by which we get vitamin D is through endogenous synthesis. I'm not going to go through the mechanism here. That's a topic for another lesson. So nonetheless, when the skin is exposed to sunlight, it produces vitamin D3, cholecalciferol. We can get vitamin D2 and vitamin D3 from our diet, but from the skin, the endogenous synthesis, it is vitamin D3. Now, when we do have vitamin D2 and vitamin D3, they both go to the liver and they get acted on by an enzyme in the liver, 25-hydroxylase enzyme, and it adds a OH group, a hydroxyl group, to each of them. So we get 25-hydroxyl vitamin D2. So we can see here this hydroxyl group has been added, and we also get 25-hydroxy vitamin D3, and we can see that the hydroxyl group has been added here as well. And the next destination is the kidneys, and in the kidneys there's another enzyme, 1-alpha-hydroxylase, and 1-alpha-hydroxylase enzyme adds another hydroxyl group, and the addition of the hydroxyl group is actually on the opposite end. So we've added one hydroxyl group here and another one here. So now we've got 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And this is also known as calcitriol. Triol, three ol, so three hydroxyl groups. We've added two, and we actually started with one. So we've actually got three hydroxyl groups now. So calcitriol, three hydroxyl groups, and it's also known as 125 hydroxy vitamin D. So what does vitamin D do? Why do we actually need vitamin D? So vitamin D, when I'm talking about vitamin D here, I'm actually talking about calcitriol. So it's the active form of vitamin D. As you can see, there's three hydroxyl groups here. Calcitriol, as we mentioned before, is important in calcium homeostasis and bone maintenance. So why is that? So when we actually have calcitriol, this active form of vitamin D, it helps us absorb calcium and phosphate from our gastrointestinal system. It also helps us reabsorb calcium and phosphate from our renal system, from our kidneys. So those are two main mechanisms as to bringing in calcium and phosphate. And how does it do this in the gastrointestinal system? So I've got a pathway here. If you want more information, I have an entire lesson on this pathway, vitamin D and calcium. But briefly, in an enterocyte, so here is a cell of the intestinal epithelium, 
and here's the intestinal lumen, and here's the blood vessel. Calcitriol enters into the enterocyte, and it can do a couple of different things. It can enter into the nucleus and activate genetic programs that lead to the production of calcium transporters on the intestinal lumen side. It can increase expression of calbindin, and it can increase expression of ATP-dependent calcium pump on the opposite end of the enterocyte. So all of this leads to more calcium being brought into the enterocyte and more calcium being pumped into the blood vessel. So it helps absorb calcium. We need calcium for bone development and maintenance. So our bones are made of calcium and phosphate. So we need both calcium and phosphate. So vitamin D is extremely important in having enough calcium for our bones. And another thing that vitamin D does is immune system regulation. So I have an entire lesson on this as well, vitamin D and immune system function with regards to SARS-CoV-2. If you want more information, please check out that lesson. I'll briefly talk about it here. So vitamin D is involved in immune system regulation by way of inducing expression of antimicrobial peptides. So peptides that go against microbes. These include catholicidins. So it helps produce catholicidin antimicrobial peptide or CAMP camp, and another category of antimicrobial peptides, defensins. These are expressed in leukocytes and epithelial cells, and there's alpha and beta defensins. So vitamin D can induce catholicidins like CAMP, and this antimicrobial peptide can bind to bacteria and reduce bacterial functioning. And then with defensins, defensin production can be induced by vitamin D, and these defensins can actually bind to viruses like influenza virus, and that actually prevents and reduces the influenza virus's ability to bind and infect other cells. And these defensins have also been shown to bind to bacterial membranes as well. So again, vitamin D is important in calcium homeostasis and bone development and maintenance and immune system regulation through its ability to induce antimicrobial peptides. So what are some of the causes of vitamin D deficiency? One of them is actually reduced exposure to sunlight. So we can see this in people that have a generally reduced sun exposure. So if they're inside a lot or they're institutionalized, they're not able to get sun exposure. We can see vitamin D deficiency in these individuals. Dark-skinned individuals are at an increased risk as well. And older individuals, so as individuals get older, they also have a reduced ability to absorb vitamin D. Another category of causes is decreased endogenous synthesis. So really the decreased endogenous synthesis really has to do with the modification of the vitamin D after it has been absorbed. So we talked about the liver and the kidneys being important areas where vitamin D is modified and formed into its active mature form, calcitriol. So in some cirrhosis patients, they won't be able to add that hydroxyl group to form 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And in renal failure, they may be lacking one alpha hydroxylase enzyme, so they won't be able to completely form calcitriol. Another category is reduced dietary intake. Generally speaking, we see this mostly in the elderly population. Another category is malabsorption. So in patients who have a malabsorptive process like celiac disease and Crohn's disease, chronic pancreatic insufficiency and cystic fibrosis, we can also see issues with absorbing vitamin D. So with regards to Crohn's disease, oftentimes the terminal ileum is affected. That is the place where we absorb fat-soluble vitamins. Chronic pancreatic insufficiency is a cause because they're not able to produce pancreatic enzymes like lipase in order to break down fats and get access to that vitamin D, and cystic fibrosis for a similar reason. The other category is medications. So medications like spironolactone, rifampin, clotrimazole, dexamethasone, phenobarbital and carbamazepine also can lead to a vitamin D deficiency as well. These actually decrease the activity of enzymes in the liver. So decreasing activity of 25-hydroxylase enzyme, for instance. And another category of causes is genetic causes. So there's a genetic condition of hereditary vitamin D resistance, and we call this hereditary vitamin D resistant rickets. So even though they have vitamin D, they've absorbed it. There's nothing wrong with the production of vitamin D. It's not being able to be used properly. And out of all of these categories, the individuals at the highest risk of vitamin D deficiency are elderly patients, overweight and obese patients, and institutionalized patients.
So I hope you found this lesson helpful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms, ways to diagnose it, and ways to treat vitamin D deficiency. So check out that lesson for more information. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.